very uh, inspiring, uh, there were some undertones of, of racial animus and racism that were sometimes very kind of covert, and sometimes very overt. Um, and so I wanted to sort of contextualize, make a little bit of sense out of it, uh, because, you know, Jeremy Lin says, oh, you know, I kind of shrug it off. It's good for me. It energizes me. But let's not shrug it off. Let's really analyze this. How, where does it come from? How are these stereotypes present? What impact do they have on people who don't have $25 million to throw around and insulate themselves? So um, I, the, the title of my talk is, But Asians Are Almost White, Right? Which, when I study whiteness, that's one of the most common things that I hear. That Asians, Asian Americans are almost white. Give you a, pre, a, 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 a prelude to the conclusion, not even close. So, but to start off with, I love Hari Kondabolu. Or Kondabolu, I can't remember how to pronounce this cat's name, I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. Um, by the way, if you don't know this comedian, find him. He's amazing, he just blew up Letterman, this guy is coming up. And don't do that Pirate Bay nonsense, like actually get his CD or listen to it, like don't steal it. But he, we live in an environment of post-racialism. Ever since President Obama was elected president, People have been declaring, we're post-racial, we're post-racial. It's the end of racism as we know it. And a lot of, of, of uh, uh, Condobolo's uh, comedy talks about the issue of race. And people critique him all the time for being obsessed with race. And he says, no, no, no. Saying I'm obsessed with race and racism in America is like saying I'm obsessed with swimming while drowning. It's absolutely absurd. And I love the way that he flips the script on that and says, no, no, no. This is a pragmatic reality that we're dealing with on a daily basis, not just some aberration. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. But Jeremy Lin, there, there, was, a, there was actually a, a really interesting public feud between uh, Michelle Malkin and the Asian American Journalism Association. Because the AJA actually had to issue, how many of you have followed the, 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 uh, when Jeremy Lin came up? Like, did you see the media coverage of it? No? A little bit? Yeah. Okay. The AJA had to issue some guidelines for reporters. You heard the reporters in the movie say we were ill-equipped to handle this? Some of their guidelines were as follows. Uh, driving, it's just part of the basketball game. It should not be linked to how Jeremy Lin can actually drive. Please don't talk about his eyes. I mean. They've seen the guy play basketball. He can obviously see. This is not an issue. But people were constantly making jokes about, oh, his eyes, because they're different, he can't see. Which, first of all, isn't funny. And second of all, is just blatantly racist. And so if you want to get your blood pressure going, which I always like to do, uh, go look at the, at the guidelines. And these guidelines were specifically in response to all the ways that reporters screwed up in the process of covering Lynn's sanity. Michelle Malkin over here, how many of you know who she is? If you really want to get your blood boiling, read some of what she's written. Asian American woman who wrote In Defense of Internment. Wrap your head around that for a second. Um, basically, in her response to the AJs uh, was that, have there been truly tasteless jokes made about Jeremy Lin? No question. But I contend that PC overreaction and opportunism have been even more vulgar. That is that these guidelines that the AJ put out was actually more insidious than the reporters who were covering, right? than the slip-ups, the racial slip-ups. And, the, oh, shoot, thanks guys. I didn't realize you left these up here for me. And the reason why I focus on this distinction is that Michelle Malkin understands and misunderstands racism as sort of an antiquated form of individualized prejudice. You're a bad person because you're racist. You're a good person because you're not. Good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And it's a lot more complicated than that. So I wanted to turn to this. Oh, sorry. My introduction into this came in grad school. Have you all seen the video Asians in the Library? Yeah, pretty popular for obvious infamous reasons. Uh, you know, <coughs> these stereotypes about Asian Americans run rampant through the American consciousness. For those of you who don't know, Alexander Wallace, an undergraduate student at UCLA, got upset. Man, that is not coming through very clearly. Anyway, she's actually there. It's, I know it's kind of blurry. Um, she made an infamous YouTube video 
where she was upset at Asians in the library at UCLA, interrupting her serene studying time. And in, doing, in posting this YouTube video, she, made, she said, in America, we don't talk on our cell phones in the library. Let's start to break that down a little bit. What does that mean? In America, we don't talk on our cell phones in the library. Well, immediately she's assuming the perpetual foreigner stereotype. That is that if she sees an Asian American person talking on their cell phone, they are not from here. Because if a white person was doing the exact same thing, they would not be put under the same scrutiny as a group. It'd just be, all oh, that person's being a jerk. But when a marginalized group does it, it becomes emblematic of the entire whole. And then, because she was frustrated, that justified her, at least in her mind, of using mock, well, people said mock Chinese, but it's not really, I mean, Mandarin, Cantonese, anyway, I'm sure that that distinction was lost on her, but she was using this ching chong, ling long, ting tong nonsense to mock her peers in her classes. By the way, did you all see Ting Tong means I love you? Yeah. yeah, no? If you have a chance, the response was beautiful, absolutely beautiful, because he took, the, the, uh, a student took her words and flipped it around and made the most beautiful music video. Took, you know, talk about taking lemons and making lemonade. Like I said, if you have a chance, see it, see it, see it. But the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, these, People think, oh, well, she was just a bad person. She did a bad thing. Well, yeah, she did a bad thing. But here's the problem with stereotypes. It takes one person to stay a stereotype. It takes a collective society to create a stereotype. So it's not just about her. It's about all of us and how we're communicating with each other and what makes the words that we say intelligible. And all too often when these issues come up, especially when it's targeting uh, professional sports figures, but even when it's just on the college campus, people always say, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You're just being overly sensitive. And actually, actually this is where a lot of my research comes in. The empirical literature says, no, 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 uh-uh. There's a concept called microaggressions. And what microaggressions are, are the subtle, covert uh, slights against a marginalized group, which perpetually tell you that you are not exactly one of the mainstream. One of the ways that I, uh, another YouTube that I absolutely love is called What Kind of Asian Are You? Again, playing into that perpetual foreigner. You know, where are you from? Sacramento. No, no, no. Where are you from? Uh, again, the implication is you must not be from here because you don't look like people who are from here. And the thing about microaggressions is such. First of all, they don't require any intent on the behalf of the person saying it to be racist. Because all too often we think about racism in very simplistic terms. Again, they're bad people and they're good people. The Klan is racist. My old uncle, he really means well even if he said a racist thing. And all too often we need to differentiate between a racist action and a racist person. Because honestly, I can't look inside your heart and I can't know what's there. And to be honest with you, this may seem a little callous, I really don't care. But I care about what your actions do and how they impact the people around you. And that's where these microaggressions come in. And ultimately what ends up happening is that there's a cumulative effect. It's not just one time, two times, three times. They occur on such a regular basis that they build up and build up and build up. And they become what Mari Matsuda refers to as words that wound. In particular, because they're so hard to absolutely identify that they can actually make the targeted person start questioning his or her own perception of it. That is that, well, you know, my friend really doesn't mean to be racist, and they're really nice, and, and I don't really think, and, and, and they really didn't intend to be, any, and all of a sudden, all of that gets put back on the person who was the target of it. And it can lead to a lot of things. Academic, uh, 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 decrease in academic performance, depression, anxiety, isolation, all these different things can stem from the cumulative impact. Again, not just one word or two words or three words or four incidents or five incidents, but the cumulative impact of it. As a quick aside, because everyone likes going in the sticks and stones may break my bones, part of the way that microaggressions are manifest is people always say something like, well, not to be racist, but, or, you know, I'm not a racist, but this never ends well. Usually if someone has to preface a phrase with not to be racist, something really racist is going to come out their mouth.
And, but it's a way that they insulate themselves to say, well, I didn't really intend to say anything racist. I just wanted to have an honest conversation. And while I can get into my high-minded academic discourse, I actually just prefer Jay Smooth. Just no, just no, stop that. Don't do it. Just, just say no, Nancy Reagan. Speaking of the Reagans, <coughs> a huge stereotype that the Asian American community faces is the myth of the model minority. And that's really sort of a context for a lot of why people think that Asian Americans are almost white, and also why we keep pushing towards a post-racial discourse. A little bit of history, because just give me a little, how old are you? 20? <laughs> when were you born? See, I was bumping the chronic and Coolio, and you were in diapers. That's beautiful. I love it. All right. Sorry, I just got to get a sense of the room. Because, I mean, this was back in 1984, so a little bit before. Um, <laughs> there were a couple of things going on at this time. There was a, a, a large cultural backlash uh, against the, the programs of the Great Society, affirmative action, and all these things. And Ronald Reagan was really playing upon this. He wasn't the first person to articulate this, but because he said it on such a massive scene uh, to a national audience, it really started to take hold. And so he said you know, that, that Asian Americans they have the sacred worth of human life, religious faith, community spirit, the responsibility of parents. And, I mean, he, this is empty rhetoric. It doesn't mean anything, but he was saying it. And the reason why he was saying it is that your values, your hard work expressed within our political system. That is, wow, you're part of us. Look at, he says, you're doing so well within our system. You are, he didn't explicitly name it in this, uh, but basically became the model minority. This is the way that all minorities should act. So, this is problematic for a number of reasons. First and foremost is there's a larger context that he's talking about. At the same time that he would valorize Asian Americans, he would demonize people like, for example, welfare queens. And a welfare queen is implicitly a single black woman, maybe a drug addict, maybe not, having multiple kids, driving a Cadillac, and refusing to work. All these pathologies, the opposite, unreligious, not community-based, having no regard for human life, very self-centered, lazy, like the, the opposite of American values. So, which is kind of ironic because actually if you look statistically, the person who's going to be a welfare queen right now is actually uh, a low-income white person who's probably voting Republican. So we have the wrong mental image in our head, but that doesn't matter when you're talking about political discourse. So, myth of the model minority. And people are always saying, well, isn't that kind of a good thing? Like, it's, it's a stereotype, but it's still, a, it's kind of positive, isn't it? And I actually submit to you, no, that positive stereotype isn't necessarily an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a positive stereotype. So you say, okay, model minority, that leads to almost white. But then at the same time, you have issues of perpetual foreigner, male emasculation. Jeremy Lin got this a lot. People were talking about, oh, he must have a small penis, and that's why he can jump so high. It's not funny, but it's the stereotypes that are out there. The exoticization of Asian, Asian American females, bad drivers, socially net nerdy. So you can start going from good and get to bad really quick when it becomes acceptable to have stereotypes assigned to a group as a whole. So what does this do in practice? Well, the first one, as I said with the myth of the model minority, it splits communities of color. It creates racial animus across racial groups that should necessarily be aligned and have each other's uh, best interests at heart. A huge issue is that it ignores issues among the Asian Pacific Islander community. That is that there are segments of the population that perform academically at the worst levels across the country. There are people who are struggling economically with depression all across the board, but their needs are not being met because it goes back to the model minority. Oh, look, no one's struggling. Look how well they're doing. And if you're judged as a group, I'll give you an extreme example, but at least you, it'll, I hope it'll sort of jar you out of why this idea of a positive stereotype doesn't exist. So, you remember the Virginia Tech shooting? Yes? Maybe? Kind of? Was it on your consciousness? The young whippersnappers? No? Kind of? All right. So, in the wake of that shooting, terrible, terrible tragedy. 
the Korean government actually issued a public apology to the United States, and in particular the victims at Virginia Tech and their families, because one of their own was implicated in this. And if you think that it's being overly dramatic, ask a Muslim person post 9-11 what it means to be seen in the, as a group. Hell, ask a sick person what it means to be implicated because racists can't tell the difference between Muslims and Sikhs. Let's contrast this example, though, with Columbine. So I know this is going to be probably before your time because it was April 20th, 1999. But very, very, very similar event in Columbine, Colorado. Two gunmen instead of one. But look at the contrast in response. My white mother, by the way, I'm half white, just FYI, don't hate white people, wink, wink, don't do and my, and my white uncle did not feel any societal pressure to be responsible for the actions of these white men, or white students. And that's part of the privileges of being white, that you get to be judged as an individual, that your actions don't necessarily reflect poorly upon your group as a whole. Whereas if you're part of a minority group, it does. So getting to some of my work, which will be semi-repetitive, but it, get, it will, will sort of uh, reinforce the points. I interview white men about race. And when the subject of Asian Americans came up, it fits really well within what the literature says. Starting off, Asians aren't really minorities, aren't real minorities. One student says, Asian people kind of seem like white people to me. And then he goes right into the model minority. I mean, it's, it's like their culture. It's more similar cultures, which also black and Latino people don't possess. Now, that's interesting in and of itself. Difficult to deal with, but interesting. We juxtaposed against these same guys who come right back and with not even a hint of irony sit, regurgitate some ridiculous Asian stereotypes. Yeah. Derek says racism has this connotation where it's always going to be negative and everything, whereas there's some aspects that's either neutral or positive, like black guys have large penises versus Asians have small ones. I don't necessarily think if Derek was the target of a stereotype like that, he would think it was so innocuous. The same thing here with George. See, George had a really weird way of talking with me because he would always say you when he meant me. And so he'd say, you know, you see an Asian person on campus, you know, you kind of think probably they don't have much of a social life or they're pre-med or something like that. So discursively, he's kind of putting it out there. I don't really believe this, but, you know, someone might. Then he laughs. Ha ha. He really did believe that, but he wasn't, didn't even have the courage to come up and stand with the strength of his convictions. At least Derek said, this is funny. George is sitting there like, well, you know, it's not really, but I'm going to laugh at it anyway. And in many respects, that's how modern day racism is manifest. Because we laugh it off. And we have the idea that sticks and stones may break my bones. Laugh it off, don't worry about it. And last but not least, myth of the model minority. Exactly what we were talking about before. Jason says, in some other cultures where education was considered very important, like many Asian American cultures, and then he links it to his own Jewish culture that we value education, that's why we are successful, but blacks and Latinos simply don't do that. And that's why they're not. So overall, all this means is that there's a huge, there's a huge tension where people continually, in particular white people, continually think of Asian Americans as almost white. Which is obviously not the case. This is simmering just beneath the surface. Then insanity comes up, and all of a sudden it starts bubbling up. And in many respects, people are paying the price right now for not having included Asian American in the discourses around diversity. When we say diversity, implicitly it means black people, Latino people, sometimes native folk, if you're a little more progressively minded, very rarely do we say, here's a diversity issue, we're going to talk about Asian American issues. And that perpetual ignoring of the issue is only exacerbated. I've talked at nauseum about the myth of the model minority, but I can't stress this enough, that it's not just about one community or another community. 
It's that that myth hits communities against each other. And also, 